Thank you very much uh, for the nice invitation uh, on to talk on mechanisms of drug resistance in myeloma, which is actually quite a challenging topic, I have to say. Oh, this is wobbly. Um, so you're all aware of uh, the current therapy landscape, so to say, uh, that we have uh, in hands now, mainly with uh, good old uh, transplantation and chemotherapy with the uh, proteasome inhibitors and the uh, uh, the derivative, uh, derivative, so the emits as you all know, and now increasingly immunotherapy with the monoclonal antibodies and probably also checkpoint inhibitors. Um, uh, this all led already to an increased myeloma uh, survival of myeloma patients, as you all know now with a medium of about 60 months. Um, however, um, when uh, patients become refractory to both major classes, PIs and emits, uh, the outcome is quite uh, dismal already, although we hope that this will now improve. Um, with the addition of the immunotherapy, but uh, up to now the data uh, say that uh, we still have a very, very short overall survival once you are double refractory to both major classes of therapy. So um, we have to deal with resistance mechanisms um, because all of these uh, patients all of obviously require resistance mechanisms that we need to define and that we need to deal with and to try to overcome or to avoid. Um, of course, we cannot now touch and discuss all what is known about uh, each and uh, every uh, single um, drug here listed, and this is certainly not uh, comprehensive here. But so I will start with daratumumab, uh, following up on Tuna's talk earlier today, yeah. go a little bit more broadly into the immunomodulators, and briefly, oops, briefly touch on uh, botasumib at the end and uh, finish with a case on molecular therapy um, because it um, nicely or uh, clearly um, showcases the challenges that we have to deal when we are trying to uh, overcome um, resistance development. Uh, this I don't need to explain further because this is the typical uh, summary slide on how Dalatumumab works and we have uh, just heard a whole talk about that. Um, on the mechanisms on tumor directly as well as the immunomodulatory functions of daratumumab. Hank Lockhurst and his team in Amsterdam has, uh, have recently shown that CD38 expression correlates uh, not only with ADCC and CDZ induction in uh, clinical patients, um, but also that the C38 levels um, uh, corresponded to responders versus non-responders in the two pivotal trials, Gen501 and Sirius trials. Furthermore, the tumor uh, treatment is associated, as Tuna already has shown, with a, a dec decrease uh, of expression of C38 on uh, myeloma cells. And in, a, in addition, at relapse of these patients, there was uh, upregulation of complement inhibitors CD55 and CD59 um, being uh, detected. Um, interestingly, um, the Amsterdam group has shown that addition of ATRA, so which we all know from acute myeloid leukemia, um, can reverse this kind of resistance mechanism by again upregulating CD38 and downregulating the complement inhibitory proteins. Very recently, the same group has now added um, a little bit to the knowledge of the darantumumab resistance um, by showing that uh, bone marrow stromal cells can induce a resistance against darantumumab-mediated ADCZ, likely by upregulation antiapoptotic proteins such as surviving MCL1, and that MCL1 and surviving inhibitors um, might be able to overcome this. So not only uh, looking for resistance mechanisms, but also showing ways how we might be able to clinically address uh, those mechanisms. A little bit more on the IMETs. Um, it has been you now well established that the main uh, target, intracellular target of all IMETs is cerebron and E3 ligase um, that uh, upon binding of IMETs to cerebron, um, uh, targets the downstream effectors of Icarus and Ilorus to uh, proteasomal degradation leading to antiproliferative effects of myeloma on myeloma cells. So it comes not as a surprise that uh, many groups have then looked into the effects and the correlations in clinical trials with expression, for example, for, uh, of Celebron, Icarus, and Iolos. Um, very early on, uh, after uh, discovery of cerebron uh, and, and uh, the relevance for IMIT, um, 
therapy. Um, in the GMMG Hovind trial, uh, it was tested whether uh, uh, the thalidomide maintenance compared to the bortezomib maintenance uh, had any correlation association with cerebral gene expression. And what was found was that the cerebral gene expression was of, sig uh, of significance um, for the patients who received the lidomide uh, maintenance, but no such effect accordingly was seen in uh, those who had a bortezomib, uh, received bortezomib maintenance. Very recently, Jan Krönke, um, who actually discovered many of the uh, uh, cerebral pathway components, um, has now reported uh, that um, Icarus expression, again, mRNA expression levels, um, are of prognostic significance when for patients, newly diagnosed patients, uniformly treated with a lenalidomide-containing uh, regimen um, followed by intensive chemotherapy, uh, namely high-dose uh, chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplantation. In contrast, the Yale group um, showed within a, a phase, uh, phase two clinical trial that compared continuous versus intermediate dosing strategies on pomalidomide uh, in notably lenalidomide refractory patients that they did not uh, see any association of Icarus and Ayalos protein uh, expression. They looked at protein expression with response or survival. However, with this, this setting of lenalidomide refractory patients, they found that pomalidomide uh, led to a rapid decline of icaros in T and in K cells, and that the induced activation of CD8 uh, positive T cells correlated with the clinical response. So mainly addressing here more the in immune microenvironment actions of pomalidomide as being of prognostic significance. Everything not predictive so far, more uh, associated with prognosis. Very recently, the uh, Mayo Clinic uh, group um, from, uh, from uh, um, Arizona um, has proposed a new model uh, or a new link of how imits work uh, upon binding to cerebellum um, uh, before uh, de degrading um, Iolos and Icarus. Um, and it's a very complicated paper and a very complicated concept, so I had, to, I think, to read it three times until I try to understand it. But um, <laughs> so I was thankfully invited uh, then to write an editorial to that, <laughs> to that paper, uh, so I had it uh, another three times uh, to read it. But anyway, so the main, the main uh, conclusion maybe in our topic to, of today is that um, the capacity of MM cells to decompose um, oxidative stress, mainly H2O2 uh, production, might be predictive of response to, uh, to, to lenalidomide and pomalidomide therapy. So this is in vitro work with also myeloma uh, uh, cells from, from patients, but of course that would need to be addressed in clinical trials, whether this is really a predictive, might be a predictive factor. Um, so, of course, we have now way more sophisticated uh, tools, mainly on DNA and RNA sequencing, and looking into what happens to what happens to myeloma cells uh, during treatment. And Ari uh, earlier today has already alluded to that. And yes, uh, Nikhil, I'm still using your old slide because it's still quite <laughs> illustrative. Um, so we have, uh, a couple of years ago, started a, a program uh, at our center on refractory uh, patients, not only to how to treat them in a maybe individualized setting, but also on how to comprehensively characterize the refractory disease. Mainly, we are, of course, usually focusing on um, newly diagnosed because how to understand the biology of myeloma itself and how to maybe at the end of the day cure that. But um, for the time being, we, I think we need to understand refractory disease, uh, mainly double refractory to imits and PIs and, uh, of course, now to antibodies to help those patients with their urgent medical need. Uh, and first results uh, were published last year uh, together with the Mayo Clinic uh, in uh, Arizona when we used their um, MP3, M3P, um, uh, panel uh, sequencing, and what we found here that uh, already with panel sequencing in this multi-refractory patient, 
cohort, the genetic landscape seems to be different, uh, quite different from newly diagnosed setting. So we, we, we saw a, a RAS, BRAF uh, mutation rate of uh, more than 70%, mainly driven actually by NRAS and BRAF mutations, as well as TP53 mutations. And actually, the TP53 mutations were almost all associated with the deletion 17P. Um, in addition, we found mutations in the cerebrum pathway, namely in cerebrum itself, as well as in Icarus and Iolus. Um, when we looked at the mutations in the cerebrum, <coughs> we found that uh, many mutations were directly in the imid binding domain, as well as truncating mutations um, uh, in a, a upstream and end terminal. Um, and though all the mutations uh, in the imid binding domain conferred resistance to lenalidomide in, uh, in vitro. However, it has to be mentioned, and I will allude to that later on again, um, that most of these uh, uh, mutations were found in a subclonal level, so it's strongly suggesting, probably at least, that there are complementary mechanisms of resistance in those patients, and uh, although these mutations clearly confer uh, cell resistance to lenalidomide, for example, in this case here, um, there might be others, uh, other mechanisms in the same patient leading to the um, resistance to the imits. And um, what we also found was mutations, um, now talking a little bit shortly about uh, bortezomib and uh, proteasome inhibitors, we also found were mutations in proteasomal subunits. And uh, Martin Korjim, now back to Würzburg, um, has followed up, on, followed up on that quite a bit now. And he took a patient where, where, we found, where he found um, four uh, distinct mutations in, in uh, the proteasomal uh, subunit beta-5, um, all notabene um, in subclones, but all in different subclones, so the, the reads were overlapping, so he could show that these are um, not the same mutations uh, in, in the same cell, not a mutation in the same cell, but uh, separate uh, clones. And um, all of these mutations conferred, again, resistance to proteasomib in vitro, in a vitro system. Interestingly, it also conferred resistance to exazomib, and most also to carfilzomib, with the exception of one, uh, of one mutation that only conferred resistance to bortezomib and exazomib, but not to carfilzomib, probably explaining why we see uh, some patients, uh, in part explaining uh, why we see some patients responding to carfilzomib after they have failed bortezomib. And I finally, I want to close with some words on molecular therapy, which was also discussed uh, earlier, briefly earlier today. Um, you all know that uh, we, we have tr uh, started treating patients with BRAF V600E activating mutations, with BRAF inhibitors, and now with BRAF and MEK inhibitors. And I can say from our experience, in the majority of cases, and we carefully select them, of course, that they are at least in a major clone, we see tremendous uh, clinical effect and we are currently um, doing that in a clinical trial. Um, so let me, but let me show one case which illustrates quite some challenges for not only molecular therapy, but dealing with resistance evolutions in general. Um, so we treated a patient, a multi-drug refractory to uh, whatever is known in myeloma at that time, um, we, and BRAF V600E clonal mutation with vimurafinib for over a year at the end of the year to avoid side effects and to prolong or to, uh, yeah, and to prevent uh, early mutations in terms of resistance development with intermediate low-dose BRAF inhibition. Um, so that was quite successful. And after a year, there were several, several lesions coming back, extramedullary as well as intermedullary lesions growing back at that time. So we biopsied five of these lesions, intramedullary as well as extramedullary, as I said, and sent them for sequencing and, and increased the dose of uh, vimurafenib to full continuous dosing again. And what we saw is, as you can see here, that some of the lesions responded and some others just grew happily ever after. Uh, until later, the next slide. <laughs> um, so, but what we saw from sequencing int was interesting. All lesions still had the BRAF V600E mutations, uh, mutation clonally. 
Um, the responding to the full dose remurafenib uh, were still without any other newly acquired mutations. However, the ones that did not respond to BRAF now had an NROS mutation. To make things more complicated, those NROS mutations were not the same, so each lesion had a different NROS mutation, right? So showcasing that myeloma has also the spatially divergent clone evolution upon treatment, um, making things even more complicated. In this case, of course, we stopped uh, with imurafenib, switched just to bortezomib dex, which we thought the patient can still stand. And what we saw that the NRAS BRAF mutated um, lesions responded nicely to bortezomib, but uh, the, the ones that had an NRAS wife did not respond at all. They just uh, grew back again. So, of course, we had to combine that in this case, and in this case, we could help the patient for another more than six months in remission. So illustrating that this is certainly, I mean, this is for molecular therapy because we can hear, we have a more clear focus and we can follow that more clearly. But at the end of the day, this might even uh, hold true for, for broader acting drugs, probably then not with one mutation that confers resistance, but with many mutations, including then the microenvironment changes, of course. Um, but it shows that we have to think in uh, terms of resistance mechanisms in a similar way to what we do with newly diagnosed patients, that we have to think in networks and we have to think and to apply combination therapies um, with broad acting, acting drugs and with um, uh, more specific drugs um, to help uh, keep all the clones and all um, the disease in check for these patients. With this, I, of course, want to thank all my collaborators and my team in Heidelberg and all the collaborators um, across the world. And in case you're still not satisfied with this meeting or repetition, <laughs> repetition is the mother of all learning. I'm happy to invite you in two weeks' time to a Heidelberg Myeloma <laughs> workshop with quite similar faculty, actually, in some respect. So um, if you want to repeat that. And thank you for your attention.